Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA, IIEA webinar, and uh, we're particularly pleased to be joined today by Dr. Hans Krüber, founding partner of Shearwater Global Strategic Consultancy, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us. Uh, Dr. Krüber will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to Q&A uh, with our audience. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion on Q&A uh, function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please be free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them when Dr. Kruber has uh, finished his presentation. Uh, a reminder that today's presentation and the Q&A session are both on the record. And please feel free to join uh, the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Let me now uh, introduce Dr. Dr. Kruber. Uh, he's a very experienced political uh, communications advisor and author of a recently published book, The Strong Men, European Encounters with Sovereign Power, uh, which is about international politics. Uh, he has a PhD from LSE, but he has a very extensive um, uh, curriculum vitae, which I think is worth going into because of the topic uh, that he's going to address us. He was a political advisor at the European Commission between 2000 and 2005 and working uh, as an, an aide to Commissioner, um, Competition Commissioner Neely Crowes and Internal Market and Taxation Commissioner Fitz Bolkenstein. And uh, during this time at the Commission, Dr. Kribble worked on a wide range of regulatory and industrial policies, including intellectual property rights, service markets, digital economy, and uh, fiscal policy. And following his time at the Commission, uh, Dr. Kribu went on to become a partner in a leading Brussels-based political consultancy and strategic communications firm, GP Plus Europe. And in that position, he advised numerous senior executives and politicians on their relations uh, with EU institutions and European media. He has advised national governments in Eastern Europe and the Middle East on foreign direct investment strategies and trade, can, trade council businesses on regulatory clearance of acquisitions, and also worked with leading American tech firms in the area of antitrust privacy and data. And in this um, position, he advised Vladimir Putin's press and communications team in the Kremlin until 2015. And then in 2020, Dr. Kruber founded his own strategic consultancy firm in Brussels, Shearwater Global Strategic Consulting with his partners, and it has offices in London and Washington. So I think we could have no better speaker to address the topic today on what is the art of the deal and how can Europe master it? So we wait with interest, Dr. Kruber, your presentation and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mary, for, um, for this very kind introduction. And thanks, of course, for inviting me. And it's really a, a great pleasure to be, to be here and to have the chance to discuss some of the ideas um, I'm developing about the EU, and in particular, how um, the EU is, is trying to find its voice in the world, a world that increasingly is about the very one thing that the EU was designed to make redundant, which is power politics and great power um, competition. Now, um, the world has massively changed over the last 10 years. And if you are a European, a real supporter of the EU, you would say mostly for the worst. Um, first, we've got a number of uh, autocratic and belligerent states on our doorstep um, who aggressively assert their interests and reject our norms. Uh, I think mostly of Turkey, Russia, but you can also think of Belarus. Um, second, we have uh, the emergence, of course, of a, of a new and illiberal superpower, China. Third, we've got the United States uh, telling us, uh, we like you guys, but we can deal with one big international security issue at the time, and that issue is China. And where the US is still interested in Europe, it clearly has different interests. Uh, Washington wants to tie Europe into its conflict with China, but Europe doesn't want to be dragged into a new Cold War. So if you add these changes up, I think the conclusion 
is, you know, the conclusion that we, most of us would draw is, this is not the future. We imagined it would be 10 years ago. And we thought the world would be increasingly multilateral, rules-based, but instead the world has become a rougher and less predictable and more dangerous place. A world um, uh, not based on the power of rules, um, but on the rules of power. And fundamental questions are now being asked of the union about how to protect its prosperity and our freedom. And if you look at Europe now, you might say, well, um, it isn't dealing with these questions very well. And I guess that's a fair criticism. The record, I think, is a bit more balanced if you look at economic, industrial and trade policy, where um, the European Union is, in fact, doing quite a lot to decrease dependency on countries such as China and to beef up its, its strategic economic resilience. Uh, but nevertheless, I'd say in terms of foreign policy as a whole, the union doesn't seem ready um, at this time. After all, for all the talk about strategic autonomy, um, what does the union actually do and what can it do? Um, having said that, um, there is, of course, um, a growing political debate about foreign policy and the realization that something will need to change. Just look at this week's events on the Polish and Russian border, uh, or look what happened over the summer in Afghanistan, um, or look at even at, at you know, the, the AUKUS alliance. Um, and um, the EU, for example, is now currently preparing um, what it calls a strategic compass, which you know, it should be a document um, uh, that, that promises to offer greater direction in these discussions. And under the French presidency, I'm sure we will all um, uh, hear plenty of, of the word strategic autonomy. So there is lots of talk and discussion um, about these issues. And if you look at these debates, I think, I think you can stake out uh, three very general and, and, and broad positions, which I will um, uh, go into now. And the first is uh, what might be called, um, uh, what I call at least, the convergence thesis. And this is the idea, once dominant in, in Western politics, that countries such as Russia, China, Turkey, uh, and so on, would over time converge with uh, the liberal mainstream of Western tradition. And um, the only thing we needed to do basically was to, to trade with these states and, and be generally friendly with them. In other words, the basic approach was, the basic strategy was cooperate. Um, now in practice, I'm not sure a lot of people still really advocate this position in Europe, European politics. Uh, of course, the view is attributed to Merkel and to Germany by her critics, uh, but I believe that's, you know, that is wrong. I, be I believe that doesn't fully describe the German position. Um, and I think you know, this convergence piece is, is now often used as, as, as a strawman in discussions, in particular um, by those who, who take a hardline position on autocrats and strawmen. Um, that brings me to the second sort of broad pieces that, that you come across in these discussions about strategic autonomy and foreign policy, et cetera. And, and that's what I call the, the sort of the ideological thesis. Um, and it's a more popular position. And it argues that you know, obviously this convergence idea is hopelessly naive because history um, is essentially uh, black and white and also, also violent. Forget about cooperation, it is argued. Forget about trade deals and so on. Uh, because it, if it comes to autocrats and, and, and strongmen, uh, illiberal leaders, basically we have to go all in. We must defeat the bad guys, much like in the past we defeated Hitler, because otherwise they will defeat us. It's either us or them. And this language is you, you can you can you can see it, for example, in the Biden administration, where the basic strategy is, you know, compete. Um, uh, there was, and or still is, the, the Biden idea of creating this alliance of democratic states, which would be led, of course, by the United States, and be mainly aimed against communist China. So 
diplomacy is considered to be largely futile on this view, if not undesirable. Um, and for example, uh, before the summer, Merkel and Macron proposed to, to hold an EU summit with Putin. And this was just after Biden had done the same thing. Uh, he met Putin in Geneva. Um, but their proposal was, was quickly shot down uh, by other EU member states who felt that Europe uh, shouldn't really be talking to Putin. Um, and another example, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, uh, is the, 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 the Comprehensive Agreement um, on Investment, CAI, as it's sometimes called, uh, with China last year. And it was clear that when this was, when this was proposed, or agreed even by the Commission with the Chinese, that a large number of people, for example, in the European Parliament, felt that basically no trade deals should ever be done with China, because you know, essentially you know, the Communist Party is, you know, is, is illiberal, is evil morally. Um, and second, you could also see the argument that China ought to be confronted really by one unified bloc of the West um, with just one spokesman, and this was obviously uh, the United States. Um, so this is kind of the second sort of hardline position on Strongman that is, I think, quite present still in Europe, though it's not shared by everybody. And then there is, I think, a third uh, um, position or theory that is put forward. And this, this what might be called, is what might be called, or I call, cooperative rivalry. And this position essentially says, well, yes, these autocrats and strongmen, people like Putin and so on, they are dangerous people. Uh, we're definitely not naive about this, but, but cutting ourselves off from the possibility of doing deals you know, as Europe uh, with strongmen just isn't in our strategic interest. Why not? Well, the economy, international value chains, and so on are more integrated now than during the Cold War. Back then, of course, the Soviet Union and China were basically economic islands. So if you look at it today, that's very different. Any radical unwinding of globalization uh, would clearly have a massive impact on our welfare. And then there are all kinds of global issues such as climate change, there are pandemics, and there's lots of regional problems, migration, refugees, security, Libya, Syria, and so on, which can only be addressed uh, by working together with autocrats such as Erdogan, for example. So in short, on the one hand, there is you know, the full understanding that you know, we have to deal with illiberal states, which won't become liberal anytime soon. Um, but on the other hand, it's equally understood that the states are you know, kind of too big, too important uh, not to talk to. So the basic strategy in this third kind of theory is, in other words, you have to compete, but you have to also cooperate. Yeah, so there are occasions and issues on which you must work together with strongmen, uh, but there are also moments when you, you basically have to compete with them, when they are rivals, not partners. And the challenge, of course, is to accurately distinguish uh, between these issues and these moments. Um, so this third position, cooperative rivalry, is where I think a whole bunch of EU um, member states are netting out, uh, certainly Germany and France. Uh, but there's obviously no consensus on this. And since consensus is required in the EU on foreign policy, this is you know, tremendously significant. Um, nevertheless, I believe that this idea of, of competitive cooperation is in the ascendancy. Uh, for example, it's made its way into this hotly debated EU strategy paper on China um, in 2019, uh, which called Beijing a systemic rifle. And this is a new, a new term that the EU introduced in this paper. Uh, but notably, it also went on to say that China was still a partner. Yeah, so we recognize we live in a dangerous world in which there are different ideological models, illiberal models who are challenging us, but we, we see also the EU claiming the right to do deals with those rivals and strongmen 
on trade, climate change, and so on. Um, but the question, of course, remains, um, how does this all work? You know, having to deal with somebody who's a rival, but also a partner, is it even possible for such a seemingly contradictory strategy to work? And there are those, I mean, take, for example, uh, the, the green MEP Butikover, Rainer Butikover, who really deny this. And they say, well, you know, our rivalry with autocrats is, is existential and it cannot be compartmentalized. Um, but while I, you know, while it, it must be recognized, I believe that there is clearly a moral tension in doing deals with, uh, with strongmen who are in some regards our enemy, I believe this is also a tension that can in principle be managed politically. And I also think that there are models for, for doing this. And ultimately it is a matter of political will and being clear about what Europe's strategic interests are. And we know that this can work, I believe, because well, first of all, um, the United States itself makes cooperative rivalry work when it wants to. And not just under Trump, but also under Biden. Uh, take, for example, um, America's phase one deal with China, which is kind of a bilateral trade deal negotiated by Trump, but then kept in place uh, by Biden. And effectively, this is America's equivalent to Europe's comprehensive agreement on investment, the CHI deal, and also quite beneficial to Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street banks. Yeah, so, here, so here we see, well, we have US China rivalry, which, which runs frighteningly deep, uh, but so far clearly not so deep uh, to rule out cooperation if this benefits Goldman Sachs for the Americans. No? And second, we also know because we also know it works or can work because if you look at how, how various strongmen in the world um, uh, use diplomatic tactics, we see that they do the same and quite successfully. For example, look at Putin and Erdogan, uh, they're clearly rivals, Turkey and Russia, in a very, very deep way. Uh, just as Russia and the Ottoman Empire were rivals in a very deep way, contesting access from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. Uh, and more recently, Putin, Russia and Erdogan, Turkey, were on opposite ends in no fewer than three wars in Syria, Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and in 2015, Turkish jets even downed a Russian MiG over Syria. Yet it hasn't stopped Putin and Erdogan from doing all kinds of deals, including the sale of state-of-the-art defense uh, systems. Um, so somehow, remarkably, we have big enemies, but they're still able to, to, to strike deals. And third, we know that this type of diplomacy works because digging a bit deeper into our own past, there is of course plenty of historical precedent that it works. Um, think for example of uh, Nixon's legendary visit to China and Mao Zedong in the early 1970s, uh, which engineered by Henry Kissinger brought communist China into the liberal fold, ultimately at America's behest. So, um, we know that kind of corporate rivalry is possible, but that's not to say, of course, that it's easy for, for the EU. Um, and why is it hard, um, perhaps particularly for the EU? Well, I'd say that first, it is incredibly hard because there's an entirely new departure um, for Europe. Because for 75 years, European states kind of mostly left it to the United States to, to make deals with dictators, which, well, credit where credit is due, the United States was particularly expert at, in particular in Latin America and the Middle East. And the tradition of realpolitik in Europe mostly disappeared after the war. What was left of it was, was kind of divorced from uh, the European Union and its, and its workings. So the EU, as we know it, um, isn't tooled up for this kind of deal-making institutionally and culturally, I'd say. 
And the same is true for most EU countries. Yeah, we're very good at trade policy. Um, we're good at development policy or development aid, but strategy and foreign policy, uh, we kind of lost the skill. And second, the second reason why it's hard for us, for Europe to do this, is the kind of inherent fuzziness of the approach. Um, you know, if, if the strategy is compete and cooperate, when do we compete and when do we cooperate? Should we do the, this guy deal with China or not? Should we do a deal with Erdogan on migrants or not? Um, the problem is there is never a categorical yes or no answer. Instead, there is only sort of the the endless weighing of different interests, and values, and the endless assessing of the historical context, and, and, and also the skill of identifying the right moment to make a deal. Um, and third, and perhaps this is the most important thing, this kind of strategy of cooperative rivalry is morally, um, and I would say even aesthetically, hard. It compels us um, to publicly pay respect to strongmen, yeah, unroll the red carpets for dictators, have banquets with people who we would normally, yeah, as private citizens, call a thug or a killer. So if you, if you actually believe in the convergence thesis, as most leaders in the West used to in the past, hosting banquets uh, with Chinese or Russian leaders is, of course, easy. Because you know, George W. Bush and leaders like Tony Blair uh, did not find it challenging to let China into the WTO, for example, morally. Um, they said this is okay because China was becoming a democracy anyway. Yeah, letting them into WTO was actually going to, to, to make sure that that will happen. But what we are saying now is something different. We're saying, well, well, Xi is you know, he's not making China more liberal, he's making it less liberal. And, steering it away from democracy, but regardless, it's okay. We're gonna to have to do a deal anyway. Um, and this is of course much harder to explain. Certainly if you profess like the EU still does uh, to care about values in your foreign policy. So similarly, if you believe history is ultimately an ideological contest, a black and white struggle between good and evil, things are, um, are also quite easy in that sense. Yeah, you simply don't host banquets at all. Instead, like Biden, you, you call G a thug, which is what he did, and Putin a killer. And you know, this puts you well in the clear, of course, and, and you win plaudits in the press. But of course, if you, have, you, know, if you practice cooperative rivalry, if you kind of say, well, we have to make deals with these people, you pay a, a big moral price and both um, politicians um, and also ultimately the public have to be ready to, to actually pay that price. Uh, and that is, that is, of course, something that in practice politicians sort of shy away from and get scared of. So finally, um, what is it then that the EU needs to do in my view? Well, one thing that I think needs to happen is that Europe needs uh, to define far more clearly and also be more explicit and upfront about what its strategic interests really are. We kind of know, of course, what the EU's values are because basically they are, they are, they are listed in the treaty in Article 2. But the same can't be said of the EU's strategic interests. Europe doesn't have a strategic doctrine and a national security strategy like the United States has. I believe, I believe it needs one. Uh, perhaps it's being drafted, but it's not quite there yet. And if we can agree, secondly, that the EU has strategic interests, yeah, um, and if we kind of know what they are, we might also recognize that we need a better institutional framework to integrate those interests in the union's decision making, because there's no body. Um, in Brussels, like, for example, the National Security Council in the United States, that systematically uh, scrutinizes decisions on, on their strategic repercussions. 
Uh, the commission, of course, does great economic impact assessments, which over time also assess impact on climate and environment uh, or on equality and all kinds of other things. Yeah. But there's no geopolitical impact assessments when, when the EU makes proposals. These don't exist. And finally, and arguably, mo arguably most importantly, um, I think we need to still fully come to grips with what the new historical situation is that we find ourselves in as Europeans, the new era uh, we are in. And, and this situation is, I think, firstly, that the United States, also under Biden, is basically looking after itself, after number one. Uh, secondly, that illiberal states like Russia no longer feel obliged by Western notions of international law and what it calls Western norms. And thirdly, that we still have to secure cooperation from those autocrats and, and um, illiberal states to secure certain certainty interests um, that we have as, as Europe as a whole. And it's only, I think, that once we appreciate this sort of situation that, that we kind of on our own, that it becomes evident that sometimes these kind of strategic, the difficult choices or these difficult trade-offs um, and tragic choices sometimes need to be made. So, and I think we can, I mean, this may sound abstract, but it's, it's very real if you look um, at what's happening this week. Yeah? Yesterday, Merkel called Putin, um, and at least according to the readout that we got, basically asked him to put Lukashenko on, on a leash to restrain him. I don't know whether it will work, and is it nice having to ask Putin, um, who Merkel probably thinks privately is, is a crook, is it nice to have him to have to ask him to do this to help us? Is it a good place for the union to be? And now, of course, it isn't. Uh, and Putin will, of course, ask for things in return. But unless we have other solutions, maybe we still need to have these difficult types of conversations. Because not doing so, basically burning the bridges, might even be worse and lead to humanitarian disaster um, in the forests of, of, in the gold forests of, of Belarus. Um, so for 75 years, the EU and uh, European member states mostly used to be shielded from making these hard choices. They used to be shielded from those dilemmas. And we convinced ourselves perhaps um, uh, in the, in, in the post Cold War era, that these choices had become unnecessary because we're all going to be liberals. But I, I believe that these choices are only going to be more frequent. And I believe that, you know, therefore the task at hand is to toughen up and get ready to make them. Um, now we may come back on the issue of Belarus in questions, but. Um, for now, I wanted to thank you for, for your attention. Um, and I, yeah, I look forward to, to uh, any questions you, you might have.